Uh, welcome and good morning to everybody. My name is Jeff Getman. I'm president and CEO of the Legatum Institute. Um, uh, a fabulous audience and distinguished guests and visitors and colleagues, including the Estonian ambassador to uh, the UK and the UK ambassador uh, to Estonia and others, too, too many to name. Um, we have a great session uh, in hand for you. The, the guest of honor is an exceptional leader. Um, and more than that, a public policy intellectual, and more than that, um, a friend of mine, and more than that, we share a number of things in common, including Mr. President uh, Tom Ilvis. Uh, friends were both uh, alums, alumnuses of an important institution called Alumni. Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. <laughs> um, I would love to introduce you, but it's my uh, role to introduce the introducer. And that's another friend it's of yours and mine. It's kind of family affair here today. Um, that is my colleague from the Legatum Institute, Anne Applebaum. Anne is the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and historian. She is director of global transition studies at the Legatum Institute. She's also just back from Canada, from Toronto, where she's received yet another distinguished prize, the Kundal Prize from McGill University for her newest book on Soviet policy toward Eastern Europe uh, after the Second World War. So with that, Anne, over to you to introduce Tom Ilvis and to moderate the conversation. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, downstairs, we were talking to President Ilvis and he said, you know, look, my CV is so long and boring. I've become so old. Why don't you just tell them that I learned how to program at age 13? And so I'm here to tell you that the president of Estonia learned how to program at age 13. Um, I will also add to that um, uh, that he's, you know, he, he does have a very long and distinguished CV. Um, among among other things, he was one of the first. He was a, before he was a Euro MP, he was a observer of the European Union for Estonia. He's also one of the He's one of the bits of glue that keeps Europe together. Um, he's, although he's the president of a small Baltic country, he makes his presence known all over the continent in all kinds of ways. Um, he's a really a great expert on Russia. Uh, we just started what would have been a very long conversation on Ukraine downstairs if it hadn't had to be interrupted by this meeting. Um, but he's also one of the people who has pushed forward um, the idea of a modern, um, a, a cutting edge idea of what it means to be European and what it means for Estonia to be European. Um, I think that's what he's going to talk about today. Um, Estonia is really at the forefront of, I don't know what we're calling it, are we calling it the cyber revolution or the cyber transformation? Um, Estonia has decided that in order to survive in its corner of Europe and in order to be uh, you know, a, 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 a a contributor to the EU and not a taker, it needs to be ahead of the game in almost everything and particularly on the web. Um, President Ilvis will talk to you about that today. After that, um, we have a little bit of time to take questions. We will end very promptly at 1214 so that people can get on to their next meetings. Um, but I will, I will moderate a, a short discussion after the debate. Thank you very much, President Ilvis. Please take the floor. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Jeff and Anne, as another way of put, characterizing it all is that I think we all would be considered in some places east of here as troglodyte cold warriors <laughs> because we talk about all kinds of things that people don't want us to talk about. But I won't talk about those things today either. Uh, but rather, um, well, I'm going to talk about, <laughs> about everything in the kitchen sink when it comes to anything that's digital. The reason why I mentioned I asked Anne to say that I learned a program at 13 is that uh, it wasn't foreseen, but I just ended up having a very bright math teacher who thought it would be a cool thing to do to teach someone how to program, or kids to program. And that has probably affected the last 25 years of my life more than just about any other part of my education, though, even though I did go to Columbia, which is not Yale, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I would say the digitized world today is so radically different from everything that we've known before that uh, 
that we should be look, looking at previous mass transformations uh, that we've seen, but even in sped up form. I would argue what we're going through right now uh, it makes the Industrial Revolution, uh, which here in the UK was so transformative, I mean, seemed like a rather minor event. Um, and there are many sides to that. The first thing is that uh, just, uh, which I'll com keep coming back to when we look at all the various problems we face in with, from Snowden to whatever, is that, you know, if you have to look back at 20 years, we didn't have anything. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have iPads. I, w I did have a personal computer, but certainly there were no notebook computers. Uh, and and one day I realized I was, I remember as a child, I used to ask my parents, how did you survive without a television? Well, in fact, I mean, now my, you know, my kids just cannot believe that there is something that doesn't have a smartphone, that, I mean, where there is no smartphone, uh, where there is no computer, and so forth. And it's even bigger than that, I would argue, that, and I will argue that when, in terms of where our security issues are today. But in any case, what we are going through is a massive transformation. And, um, on sort of on an order that we, it's very difficult to see at the time that we're in. We can see galaxies far away. It's much harder to see where we are ourselves. And so, I mean, we, once people figured out what the steam engine could do, you could suddenly start mass producing things. As soon as you people, when you started having an automobile being mass produced, suddenly you needed things that you never needed before. A highway overpass. Uh, having cars meant you ended up with suburbias, that before that there were no suburbias. I mean, if you didn't live in the city, then you were living in the countryside, and you didn't go to the city. So, um, so we're at the stage, I would argue right now, where everyone's bought themselves a Model T Ford, but we haven't gotten to the point where we, we started thinking about uh, the highway overpasses and all the other things that, ha that go along with this technology that we have. Uh, and this will be transforming the way we run our lives. It already has in many ways, and it's not only uh, regarding comfort and ease of doing things, uh, but also it also involves threats in, in ways that were never threats before. And also, uh, it changes certain ideas. I say I would argue the uh, the Enlightenment idea of privacy, or as you would say here, privacy, which didn't really exist before the Enlightenment. Uh, because uh, it was everything was everybody's business, and uh, that notion, as it evolved through the development of liberal democracy, has been, of course, a key issue. It's enshrined in constitutions, but even those ideas are changing. And now I'm going to focus mainly on my own country because uh, because we have actually invested, I think, more energy. I don't know if money, but certainly uh, sort of effort into IT and the use of IT and modernization side than just about anyone else. Uh, this is not because we were so wonderful, but rather it was a conscious choice that when we came out of 50 years of Soviet occupation, we were really in bad shape. Uh, I mean, we had a, a GDP of under 2,000, GDP per capita to under $2,000 per capita. I mean, poor. Uh, we had 50 years of, of um, uh, undevelopment, lack of development of our infrastructure. Meanwhile, everyone was building, you know, autobahns and whatever they were building here in the West that we enjoyed in Munich, uh, at Radio Free Europe, and not to mention the United States. I mean, this did not happen. Did not happen. I mean, yes, the military infrastructure was in good shape. It, it was all designed toward attacking the West. Uh, but other than that, I mean, we were using a 1938 uh, rotary-style telephone exchange in the city of Tallinn. I mean, it was very modern when we put it in, installed it uh, two years before we were occupied by the Soviets. But it really wasn't where uh, where uh, we wanted to be. Uh, and so the decision that we made, influenced by a number of factors, and at least my thinking in this was that okay, we are really uh, it's going to take us a long, long time. We are still building out our highway network uh, because building highways take time. But, but there was one area where we are on a level playing field, uh, and that was in IT because everyone was uh, sort of at the, uh, 
the zero point in the early 90s. I recall that it was only in 92, 93, the first web browser mosaic came out. I mean, and then this again shows how quickly things, there were no web browsers before 1992. Uh, so the development that we, were, we started off at was basically the same as the most highly developed countries. And so we decided to invest in that. The reason why I mentioned uh, that I learned to program at age 13 was that actually, so I was never really daunted by the idea of computer technology, and it, more so it was that since I'd learned to program at 13, I mean, not anything great, but I mean, it meant that I could deal with these things. Uh, I pushed through something to get all Estonian schools online, I mean, equipped with computers and with connections, and this was uh, by 1997 all Estonian schools were online. Uh, there were other factors as well. I remember reading this neo-Marxist Luddite book called The End of Work by Jeremy Rifkin, which was uh, basically about how bad computerization would, <clears throat> was in that it would lead people to not have jobs. And his most salient case that he brought was a steel plant in Kentucky that employed 12,000 people and produced X hundred thousand tons of steel. The Japanese bought it, automatized it, computerized it, and then they produced still X amounts of steel, but they did it with 120 persons instead of 12,000. Now, of course, that is bad if you're Jeremy Rifkin. If you're a country of 1.3 million and everyone's talking about economies of scale and you're all nervous and anxious about, anyway about your small size, uh, this was this, I thought, this is brilliant. Let's computerize everything. We'll let, we'll let the computers do all those things that, in fact, machines can do and people shouldn't be doing. And I'll come back to that because that's what we've basically tried to do in our society. Um, and so, and I would say since the time we done, have done that, uh, we have become all kinds of things. Um, NATO cybersecurity center is in Italian. The EU cybersecurity center is in Italian. We have uh, we <laughs> some of these kids who started playing with computers in the early 90s uh, invented Kaza, for which they almost went to jail in the United States. But they got out of that, and then they were approached and, uh, by some investors, and then they started something called Skype, so which is also an Estonian invention. Um, and right now, I guess the FT every other week is writing about another one, which. Uh, Estonian startup called TransferWise, which allows people to bypass those huge obscene uh, fees taken charged by banks if you want to transfer money from one country to another in Europe, and they've figured out how to do it for basically nothing. And so, anyway, <laughs> that was. So, I mean, we're moving quickly ahead, and right now, I guess one of, one of the people that people that do talk to us, uh, we're one of the countries that people all over talk to about doing something in society to, to, uh, to, to get, uh, to, to become uh, interneted, developed. And so, uh, and why they do that is, uh, aside from those things I mentioned, basically 99% of bank transactions are online, have been done online since the early, since the beginning of the millennium. 99% uh, <clears throat> of uh, Tax returns are done online, have been since the late 90s. Uh, we have 25% of the of votes in the past two elections have been cast online. You can vote anywhere in the world. Uh, and we can go on and on. We have 96, 7% <coughs> of, bless you, of uh, prescriptions are done online. You know, you don't go, no one goes to the pharmacy with a piece of paper. If you get a prescription, you go to the pharmacy and you share your ID and your doctor has written it in there. If you want to have access to your medical records, you have access to your medical records online if you want. Uh, and I can go on and on. But all of this, in order to do this, is that you need to have a few, basically take care of some a few fundamental assumptions, and these I will talk about, which is, uh, and we'll also, this in, by doing so, touch upon the fundamental neuroses of Euro Europe and also the fundamental problems we face with Mr. Snowden. The foundation to having a functioning society based on using computers is 
a secure online identity. There was a joke in the, uh, in the um, New Yorker 15 years ago. It's a picture of a dog next to a computer, and the dog says, uh, online, no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> well, this is the problem. This is the problem. You must know who you're talking about if you, you need a trusted identity if you're going to have a society that works based on, I mean, that uses all of this IT, <clears throat> IT technology. Because otherwise, you don't know if you're talking to a dog. Your bank doesn't know if a dog is talking to it when it wants your money. It doesn't know if it's a, if it's a uh, bank robber. Uh, your bank, uh, or neither you nor your bank, know whether it is uh, the NSA. I mean, no one, you do need to have a secure identity. Uh, and because in order, the, the secure identity is the basis of any contractual relationship. You need to have a, con I mean, and society is based on contractual relationships. In the US, we call, you call it, Tort law, I mean, basically, what happens if you, if you fail to live up to your obligations in Germany is called the law on things, but we won't get into that. Uh, and uh, if you have this identity, you can then start to develop a society that, in fact, is based on contract, that where contractual relationships can be done digitally. Uh, in Estonia, since introducing an electronic ID with an uh, electronic signature law, uh, that means that um, well, we have had in the last 10 years uh, 140 million contracts signed online. So, and what that means, I'll get to better examples later, but for example, this just came up recently, <coughs> where I know a head of a company had to sign an agreement between someone in Belgium, someone in, I think it was the Netherlands and Estonia, and in order to do that, um, he could not, I mean, he had to go, they had to all get together and sign it. Now, if you, saw, but say Finland and Estonia have mutually recognized digi digital signatures, you can sign it basically, you can start a company or do any, do any contract in a matter of 10 seconds. So, I mean, this is, this is the kind of stuff that we can, the friction that we remove in society uh, by, by actually allowing, doing the things that are allowed and enabled by a secure identity. The other side of this is what, is that uh, all the bad stuff that happens when you don't have a secure identity. Um, we see, we live in societies today where robbing or rather stealing money from a bank emptying a bank account is written off by a bank as a business expense. Even worse, a, a uh, power plant that happens, <laughs> that fails because of, uh, because of a uh, computer attack <coughs> would claim to the insurance company's force majeure. It's, it is not a, it is neither force, it is not a f case of force majeure, an act of God, nor is a, the money lost from your bank a case of, uh, just a business expense. Those are all avoidable things. In fact, there's no reason to have them at all. Uh, but uh, but you don't have. But you need to have an identity uh, that would that is readily associated with a person to avoid that. That can be asked by any entity that needs to know who's at the door. Um, and here I would argue, and you'll, uh, what I will talk about at length today, is that basically it is the role of the government to do this. Uh, the role of the government is the, uh, it has to come in and provide the secure identity. There's no other way of doing it, unfortunately. Um, and because these are all cases of market failure, and ultimately when you have market failure, you need a government. Uh, my inner libertarian, uh, doesn't really like me saying this, but unfortunately my experience has brought me to this, that basically it's, it's, it is only the government that can, um, <clears throat> you, can legal, you can count on to legally and enforceably guarantee the security of online life. Um, just as in fact the government, whatever government it is, are the only ones with the right to enforce traffic regulations, food safety standards, and so forth. Um, 
So I know this is all very odd sounding, given the hysteria that, has, that broke loose on June 6 this year uh, and the various revelations, but, but basically no one else can guarantee the security uh, of online life besides your government, just as no one else can guarantee the security on your roads, on the, the M3 or M6 motorway, or on the digital highway. Um, and we have to, I guess, grow up. You, we can fret about, to take it out of the digital realm, we can fret about traffic cameras on the side of the road um, or radars monitoring us uh, as we drive along the road to prevent us from, um, from speeding. Um, and we can worry about that, yes. But on the other hand, would we say that we shouldn't monitor traffic speed? Should we say, you know, do whatever you want? Is it okay to speed? Um, and I think the same thing is true as online. And once we, things settle down, I think we'll get to that. The way our system works in Estonia that makes, allows all of this thing is that we have a public-private partnership that, uh, that authenticates identity. Uh, the identity is, is, uh, in a, is guaranteed by a com private company that says this is that person. And what they look at is something, it's a two-factor uh, a two-factor identification system based on a public key infrastructure, and if you want, I can talk about that, but basically it is a system of encryption that was developed in the late 70s where there's a public key that everyone has and a private key that you also have that allows you to communicate without anyone, uh, that is securely communicate it is the basis of all secure communications anywhere in the world. We just gave it to everybody in the country. So everyone has one of these little cards that I live in my, left in my briefcase, or you can use it, on, um, you can use it uh, in your phone because what you do need is a chip. You need a chip. Your SIM card in your phone is a chip. We also offer people chips, which they have in the, carry in this card. And that allows the, the secure, highly, highly encrypted relationship uh, guaranteeing your identity and your unique identity. Um, once you have that identity and the fact that it is guaranteed and, only, and, you can, and no dog can be you, at that point, the whole world opens up in terms of possibilities because it's not just your relationship with with whoever you're talking to, but in fact, it's the relationship of everything to everybody in your society that also has a unique identification number or ident identity. So instead of just communicating, when I write a letter or write, communicate to the bank, we can, based on the system that is secure, have secure communication between people looking from people in the tax ministry, the tax department, which allows the tax returns to be done online. It means that when you vote, you can in fact vote where they don't. I'm using a program that removes your personal vote as identifying you as voting that way, but that guarantees that you are you. Just as when you go vote on paper, you have to bring your whatever driver's license or something and say, this is me, and they look at the picture and they say, that's you, and you can vote. Well, so too, we can do this. And instead of having, like most countries, having absentee ballots abroad or people going to consulates to vote, you can vote anywhere in the world that has a connection. Um, and what we've done now is connected all of the, all of the, uh, the various aspects of government and the private sector, so the banks are all involved in this system, and it's, banks are very happy because there's far more secure uh, bank relationship between the customer and the bank having a secure identity than having these little funny cards that have little code numbers that can be broken and stolen and so forth. This system has not been broken into yet and probably will not be able to be broken into in a serious way for another 30 years given the level of encryption and the level of the uh, projected increase of computing power over the next 40 years. We're looking maybe at 35, 40 years before this level of encryption can be broken and by that time we'll have something else. Uh, what happens, what is also crucial and what I mean, that, we're try that we did, and we're trying to push all of this through in the EU, is that we passed a law which says that the government may never ask you for any bit of data more than once. 
That is to say, <laughs> once they have your address, you never have to put it in again. Uh, once they know what your bank account is, they, you can never ask me again. Um, and what the effect of that is, it, by, it perforce creates a government cloud. And also a cloud for all other services, but in any case. So uh, the example I always give is in Estonia, it takes 18 minutes to register a company. Uh, I mean, in country. Someone told me in Italy it's 18 months. But, um, but the thing is, why, why does it take so long to register companies? Because you have to sh document all kinds of things proving that, you know, who's on your board. Do, do you or any of the board members owe back taxes? Have they been com convicted of a crime? All of these things. And then you go from ministry to ministry, usually, and sort of in, the, in most countries, then someone pulls a stamp and says, yes. No problem, and then you take the same stack of papers, go to the next of Michigan, another stack of papers. You do this in democracies, you do this in authoritarian regimes, it's all the same. But in Estonia, since we have this law that says you may not ask anyone anything if the government already has those data somewhere, uh, then you go there and you just give the people who are in your, I mean, on your board, you know, your, your address is already known, I mean, or you can say this is my address, and then the rest of it is up to the government's computer system to figure it all out. And if you check off all the boxes that the board members have paid their taxes, no, they have not been, I mean, they have no outstanding debts. They have not been convicted of a crime. All of that, so 18 minutes later, you get this thing also electronically saying, yes, you are now registered as a company. Now, you can take this to all kinds of other realms as well. We have, um, we, have, uh, we, have the, we have an e-medical system um, where all your records are available to you online. And this, this comes to another crucial law, which is you own your own data. You are the owner of your own data. No one else owns the data on you. You have a right to see whoever is using your data, and you have, and you, you have a right to move certain data if you want. Um, this is, say, in stark contrast to a president of a, what a president of a country told me when he visited, when we showed him the system. He said, really? In my country, all medical records are on a paper, are in a file folder, or as many as they need, and each file folder says explicitly, never to be shown to patient, uh, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's a little different approach from ours. But what does this mean? I mean, for what it will mean, and the transformative power of this, I think, which is one reason why I think doctors really don't like it, is because, in fact, this kind of system is taking the traditional sacerdotal priesthood relationship of the doctor up on the pedestal and the supplicant patient below. It is destroying that. Because, in fact, you know, people say, get a second opinion. Well, in Estonia, you go in there and you can authorize whoever you want to look at your medical records. You can get a second opinion, you can get a tenth opi opinion, however many you want. I mean, if you're willing to pay for it, of course. But I mean, the point is that you can determine and decide who sees your records. Okay, we have the system now. I mean, what I've described is how it works within the country. Um, and the system, I mean, for those technical people here, it's a data exchange layer that allows different ministries, banks, you know, picket, ticketing companies that sell concerts, all of this is on there and they can talk back and forth and everyone is, is trusts the, the, these identities, but it only works in one country. The next step and where it becomes interesting uh, for Europe is that you end up doing this between countries. Uh, and we have now taken the first step in February in which we have agreed with Finland to share the, the data exchange layer. What that means, first and foremost, is bad news for people who want to cheat on taxes because it allows the tax authorities in both countries to check online constantly in real time uh, all these uh, dubious claims on VAT because, well, of course, this is an island, you don't have this problem. But in any case, where you have, <laughs> where you have countries abutting one another, the people, co companies are always playing games with, uh, with VAT, saying, oh, we paid it over there. 
and then meaning the other country, and then in that country say, oh, no, we paid it back there. And so this uh, huge loss in revenue we've noticed in the last several years, all over Europe, by the way, just with new schemes. But anyway, so to, to, get, to, to fight that, we, we, came, we came up with this thing with the, with the Finns. Now, okay, that's, we have, that exists right now. Where we want to go on is that same thing with medical records, same thing with prescriptions. If you are a Finn who comes to Estonia and you're vacationing on the island and you drop your medicine into the sea because you know, you're on the sailing boat and not too many beers, you, um, you take your mobile phone, call your doctor in uh, Lapland and say, look, I just lost my whatever it is, and, uh, and then he will type in the prescription. And when you get to shore, you go to whatever pharmacy and you put in your card and they say, okay, here's your penicillin. Or right now we have lots and lots of Finns coming to Finnish pensioners visiting my country, and since they're sort of in their 70s and you never know what's going to happen, they, take, they carry along their medical records. And then they come for three months and then they go back home. Well, in the future, and this is what we hope to do uh, in the near future, is that, well, you come and if you need to go to the doctor and you, someone has to look at your medical records, you go there and you just put your card in and you put in your code and the doctor can see it. The idea then, of course, is to move this into, into all of Europe. It's going to take us a long time, but at least the, we, I think that the countries that uh, have the, uh, both the, the technical uh, hardware uh, sophistication, uh, the countries that have the software sophistication, and the political sophistication to do that uh, can move ahead because it'll all be very good for citizens. And um, uh, we see, for example, we are working closely with the UK on this. Now the question is, I mean, there are certain issues with the UK uh, where uh, the Anglosphere, uh, I said the, the, <coughs> the, <laughs> The English-speaking peoples whose history was chronicled by Winston Churchill, um, or alternatively, the Five Eyes community, is another way of looking at it, but basically the UK, Canada, the United States, and uh, Australia and New Zealand, for some reason, ha all have an aversion to the idea of an ID card. Uh, so, you know, sort of so I don't know if it's going to work with us in the UK, but certainly the failure of the UK digital prescription system was based on having a, a swipe card when it cost six billion pounds or something. Anyway, a swipe card, I mean, it's not a secure identity. Uh, you can't be guaranteed of anything based on those data or the, the level of security. Uh, and, and we, I mean, I, I think it's quite clear to us that unless you have a secure identity, which can be only guaranteed with a chip card in these days, uh, you won't have a functional e-governance system. So we're cooperating with the UK, but we'll see how far the UK is willing to go. And I understand there's some ideas there on how to do identity here, and we'll look closely at it because we would very much like to develop our cooperation with those countries that, in fact, have an interest in doing this uh, and also have the, the wherewithal to do it. I mean, the willingness to move ahead politically. Um, now, this, of course, touches upon the big fears that have been exacerbated since the 6th of June, having all to do with the fear of Big Brother. And as I said in the beginning of my talk, that we're living in an era in which the ideas, traditional ideas, even as privacy, are kind of flying out the window. Um, and... Uh, even before the revelations that started coming out this June, we were dealing with this issue in the European Commission where I headed the e-health e -health task force, and right now I head the uh, cloud computing task force on de developing European cloud, which is this fundamental fear of people following you and having, knowing things about you and so forth. And since, uh, since what we've heard from... Uh, since the 6th of June, th this has become a really hot item. Now, of course, one of the things that people don't realize is that um, when we talk about Big Brother, we have all been willingly participating in pu putting all our data up anywhere, anyway, for all these years. 
uh, at least as long as we've had credit cards, smartphones, uh, and so forth. Smartphones, I mean, you, we all have, I mean, most of you have smartphones. You probably have a free app in there, um, an app in which you put in whatever you put in. I have, you know, I, I have this thing where I put in how many push-ups I did and all those things. Now, if you think that people are sitting there designing apps that you download for free because they're all so interested in being good Samaritans, then, then I can sell you a lot of things. A bridge in New York City, probably a bridge in, over the Thames as well. But the point is, people don't design apps because they don't want money. They are doing it for something. And one of the th ways, you, I mean, you can either sell advertising or you can monetize the data that you, or sell the data that you have. There's a wonderful book uh, which talks about some of these things. It's called, the book's called Big Data. It appeared in May of this year by, I have this, Meyer Steinmeier Berger. Yes, anyway, it's just, he's a German professor at Harvard and plus uh, some other guy who was a former editor of, at The Economist. For some reason, I have this block against their name. Anyway, they, it's, it's, it's very good to describe the kinds of things that are being done today with big data, metadata, and where do they get these data? And this is the story there, which is true because it was, they're reporting it from the New York Times, so it must be, that in fact there was a case where there was a company in the United States that's, that uh, did direct marketing to pregnant women. Pregnant women over their pregnancy at different times of the pregnancy have different things they would like to buy and eat or drink or not have pickles or have pickles, all of that stuff. And, um, and the way they, the data upon which this was based were, <clears throat> was from the swipe cards of women's credit cards. And you can see, you know, woman buys this, this is her email address, we send her a, we send her a, uh, some kind of promotional material. Uh, this is not, has nothing to do with the NSA. This is just buying swipe card data. And so then it led to the ca this case that uh, this, this book is about how accurate m um, big data and metadata can be. So it led to the case where this company suddenly gets a phone call from a father saying, you have sent my 15-year-old daughter pregnancy material. How dare you? And then the company, of course, this being the overly litigious United States of America where anything can cause a... $50 billion lawsuit, decided we better call her back, call him back and say we're sorry and we'll offer you a deal and it's, you know, to cover it up. And then so they call the guy back, the father, and the father's very contrite on the phone because he's been yelling at this company, you know, a couple hours earlier and they, he said, I had a heart to heart with my daughter and in fact she is pregnant. So, so the, these, these, I mean, the information that is out there, that is being used by companies, that is being, that is available to be used has, uh, is just enormous and it has very little to do with the NSA, with uh, GCHQ or any of the other bad alphabet soup organizations. So we, uh, and I, I, I prefer to call this little sister as opposed to big brother because big brother is the, is the, you know, NSA and all those bad guys and everything. But little sister is the one who knows everything about you, everything about you and, um, and it tells everybody. Uh, and so, so I think that we actually have to deal, uh, deal with these issues far more seriously and this is why things such as, uh, I mean, if, we, if the rest of Europe would accept, for example, our chip card as, a, as, a, um, as, a, as the identity that you need to prove when you're doing credit card transaction, then in fact you wouldn't have companies that made their money based on swipes, it's also, and that's one reason why swipes also don't work with, I mean, swipe cards don't work if you want to have a unique identity and buy, med, uh, buy medicine. So the issue today we face in all of this, whether we're talking about Estonia, the UK, or anything else, is trust. Um, and the, uh, the loss of trust that has now taken place regarding the internet is profound. Um, again, before, before Snowden, I, I, I did a seminar about two years ago in, in Brussels at the Brussels Forum where there was a U.S. congresswoman who sort of dealt with the issue of 
IT security. And she said that she has buried in, co <clears throat> in coffee tins $60,000 around her ranch and has 10 guns, and she plans on going off-grid if anything ever gets serious. Okay, I mean, so, well, that's one solution. I mean, <laughs> this is, I'm not saying, but basically we are very connected, and our lives are very connected, and, um, and, and with, the, with sort of this knowledge now that everything is technically available to be followed, we need to come up with a, with a new understanding of issues. We have a new understanding of what privacy is, what you can do, um, and what, what we can do with our societies, or the alternative is throw out your iPads, throw out your iPhones, or whatever smartphones, Nokia, you name it. Um, you have to not use computers, and you probably can't do a lot of other things either. For example, supermarkets today, like power plants, are all run on things called SCADA systems. SCADA systems, SCADA, S-C-A-D-A, -A, it stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. These are the systems on the feedback loops, basically, to simplify over the internet, by which everything is run today. Uh, you know, when I was a kid in New Jersey, there would be someone who would go, uh, there would be a file clerk, uh, there'd be a guy wearing an apron going around in the aisles of supermarkets and counting how many cans of peas there were, and then they'd order peas for the next week. Um, just trying to stay in time. But today it's all done online. Uh, just as your, your nuclear power plant is run by a SCADA system, which looks at you know, what the raw temperature is and all this other stuff, just as <laughs> the uh, uranium enrichment, uh, enrichment uh, centrifuges in Iran were run on a SCADA system. So if you get into that SCADA system, uh, you can destroy it, or you can do something very funny with it, and be it your supermarket, or as happened last year in Los Angeles when the, uh, the traffic controllers went on strike, the street traffic controllers, they, started, they put some bugs into the uh, traffic lights. And so there's a SCADA system that runs all of the traffic lights in London and in New York and everywhere else. Imagine the havoc that would be created if you just play around with that and all the lights turn red. Imagine the havoc that you'd have in London if you turn all of the lights green. I mean, the, I mean so our lives are so dependent upon all kinds of high-level technology and electronic systems that, it's, uh, that these days you really, if you want to go off the grid, you really have to go off the grid and probably Wyoming is about the only, Lapland are probably the only places you can live. Um, but I mean, think about it at the personal level. Um, what happens if you're, someone tampers with your data? Say you're RH positive and someone changes and, and your medical records say you're RH positive and someone changes to RH negative. Uh, in the old days, it would be hard to do because you have to go and erase it from the paper medical records. But these days, you don't have to do that anymore. Imagine if someone comes in and, or someone go, breaks into the, uh, whatever you call it here, your bursts, and wipes out all of the records. Or maybe they just sort of wipe out some company's records. Or maybe they sort of increase somebody's records. And maybe they increase someone's bank account, or maybe they wipe out someone else's bank account. All of that is, since everything is so computerized and digitized these days, all of these things are possible. So, which gets me, I would sort of, these are all examples of the kinds of issues we face that we've been all concerned about privacy, confidentiality, um, that has surround, that is associated with the whole issue of Snowden. I would argue that's peanuts compared to the issue of integrity. Because privacy is someone can see what you've said. But the, what happens if you can change what you've said? It's not you can see what your bank accounts say, but you change what your bank accounts say. And that is, that is the issue of integrity of data. And I predict that will be the big issue in the future uh, that we will have to deal with. There are technological solutions to these things, but I would argue we are far too obsessed with the issue of, uh, of, 
of the confidentiality side of this issue. It's nice to be obsessed with it, but we should be thinking about it. If they're getting into this stuff, and of course, we, there's no reason to think it's only the NSA, or it's only GCHQ, that, you, that, there's a, that undemocratic countries can't do this and they don't do that. Only the democratic countries <laughs> go in and read your mails. By the way, they can't read your mails, but anyway, they can, read who, they can see who you talk to. But the problem is that everyone can do this and not everyone is very nice. And so when we look, about, look at what the, the society, societal threats we face in the future, it's not just that someone can sort of theoretically at least read your mails, uh, but they can also theoretically or in reality, as was the case in Stuxnet, alter what is in your computer. And when you are in that phase, we should, when we are having reached that phase, we should start getting worried a lot. And I could go on and on. I will just say that at this point, I would argue that if the, the minimum we need in our societies is to prevent those kinds of things are, uh, is to make sure you, you, ha you always need to have an identity to access anyone. We right now are coming to the conclusion that you also need to have an identity assigned to every data bit that you use, which is not a complex thing to do, but in fact, you, uh, Stuxnet, if every input which, uh, which was, went into those centrifuge controlling systems had an identifying marker, would not have happened because they would, they, the programs would reject things that are not identifiable. Um, these are the complexities we will be facing. Our societies overall everywhere are becoming more and more controlled by computers. We are more and more vulnerable and if we don't start coming up with ways to make sure that these things are secure, we're going to have some big problems in the future. I won't talk anymore. I'll answer your questions. But I do want to say, ultimately, what we need is uh, develop, we need to develop a, a Lockean social contract in the digital world, an understanding. I don't mean we sign a little thing here, but. Uh, but basically, what was Locke? I mean, what is, what is, in true two treatises in government, I mean, he talked about this treaty or this contract, implicit contract between the state and the citizen. The consent of the governed allows the government to do things. This was his response to Hobbes' view of this, uh, of life before government as a war of all against all, we all know, Primitive man's life was nasty, brutish, and short, and all that, yes? Well, you know, Hobbes' solution was that we need a strong sovereign. That's the kind of solution we see coming from Mr. Putin. That's the kind of solution we see coming from in Iran. I mean, we're going to make our country safe by making sure that we control everything. Um, what we need here is, as part of our liberal democratic enlightenment tradition, is that we, we need to come up with a deal between us and government, which makes it hard for me because I have to make a deal with myself, but the point is that um, um, that means that we need to at least have a fundamental understanding that there are certain things that are true, and this is that uh, in these realms, identity, we trust the government, and the government basically doesn't screw us. All of the other stuff which um, you know, that we do on the web uh, can remain in the what, you know, this the former, I mean, what is that? The, uh, the digital guru, former, former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, uh, John Perry Barlow wrote in his classic thing nine, 20 years ago, Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, uh, in which he talked about, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us in the cyberspace. And it was kind of this very sort of, far out thing, which I liked very much in 1996, but, I didn't, but then society wasn't so dependent upon IT. And I would say that that's all fine, do whatever you want on the internet, look at all the sites you want, that's all fine. But when it comes to the crucial aspects of society that involve the security of the citizenry, we need to come up with a relationship that we understand, all of us understand. The government will provide us with the security that, uh, that we need to be on the internet just as the government, just as the government today does, 
You know, if you if you're a real wild man and you want to you want to not be subject to the laws, you go and hunt your own food. But I bet you still take the wild boar that you shot to the health authority to make sure it doesn't have trichnosis. I mean, that's the way it works. So we need to, the government to do that, and we have to. I would argue that's where we have to work things out in the future, especially in the European Union. The problem is with the European Union is that no one knows anything about computers. But okay, I will. <laughs>